Well, welcome to the Institute of Managers and Leaders and session two of our final development day for 2023. Today's, today's development day is all about the idea of seeing around corners or being able to create tomorrow's workplace today. My name is Scott Martin and I'm the General Manager of Product, Membership and Marketing at the Institute and I'll be your host for this session, this second session of the day. Can I begin by paying our respects and acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and also pay respects to elders both past and present. The Institute of Managers and Leaders is the peak body for management in Australia and New Zealand and the largest member community of managers and leaders dedicated to, to de developing management as a professional body. This development day, our third for the year, is just part of a great suite of learning and development resources that we have available to organisations of all shapes and sizes. This includes short courses, webinars, events, and a range of signature leadership, program, leadership and development programs. Just some housekeeping before we get started. Please keep your microphones on mute during the presentation, and there will be an opportunity at the end to post some questions in the chat box. However, feel free to post questions or comments as we go along in the session, and we will attempt to answer as many in the allotted, in the allotted time. After all the sessions today, we will be sending out a collection of hand-selected resources for each presentation, along with the IML action plan for those who don't already have it. The action plans are a great resource to help you jot down and highlight and apply the learnings from today back into the workplace. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our presenter for this session, Dr. Mark Deeding. Mark is a UNSW Senior Research Fellow based at the Black Dog Institute of the research lead within the, the Workplace Mental Health Research Program. He has over 13 years experience in the field of mental health and substance use disorder research. Dr. Didi has extensive expertise in the development of digital interventions, online service delivery, clinical trial evaluation and workplace mental health. His primary research interest is in improving access to evidence-based prevention and early intervention through technology and the translation of research into practice, particularly as it relates to vulnerable populations, including young people and high-risk workforces. Please join me in welcoming Mark uh, to present today's session two. Um, thanks so much, Scott. Um, and thanks for everyone to, for showing up today. Um, uh, I hope this is somewhat informative, but I thought today I'd, I'd like to just talk about I suppose the, the topic of, of workplace mental health broadly, um, but I guess specifically in, in I guess a post-COVID context. And um, I mean, if, if that's if that's where we are now, but um, definitely this idea of how to strengthen workplaces and 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 specifically through um, I suppose evidence-based uh, practice, um, which is what which is I guess the, the focus I have um, around making sure that what uh, organizations and, and businesses are doing and leaders are doing is actually um, based in, in good evidence. Um, so uh, in terms of kicking off, um, go ahead. Uh, Scott's already um, think, uh, done the acknowledgement of country, so I, 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 I also like to extend my acknowledgement of the traditional owners, um, past, present and emerging. Um, and as, as Scott mentioned, I, I work for the Black Dog Institute. And for those that aren't aware, uh, it's a medical research institute. But what what I suppose is the main, what sets the institute apart somewhat in, in, in a lot of respects is the idea that a lot of the focus of the research is directly translated into, into action. Often there's a bit of a lag between when the research happens and, and changes in practice. And, and there's real focus on the institute of trying to uh, remove a lot of that lag. And, and, and there's a number of ways in which we do that. There's, a, there's an education um, team within the Institute um, that rolls out programs, uh, both in the community, um, in schools, but also in workplaces, um, as well as a, a clinic um, and, and, a mark, and a pretty significant marketing team and, and a range of uh, initiatives that the Black Dog Institute um, is involved in to try to push out that, that research um, into the community and into practice. Um, but specifically within that, uh, within the Institute, I work uh, within the Workplace Mental Health Research Team. So our focus really is on the links between um, mental health and wellbeing and work. Um, and, and, also, and also to, I guess, to a lesser extent, improving occupational outcomes for those who are experiencing mental ill health. But 
primarily, I guess, my work within the team focuses on that that former category of of, of what of this, what are the links and 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 how can we um you know how can we look to I suppose lessen some of the um, negative impacts when it comes to to mental health risk and and workplace. Um, and the team's been running for about ten years now, and and I currently am the uh, the research lead within it. Um, so, in in all, I guess today that the main thing I was hoping to cover was this idea of exploring concept, the concept of, of psychosocial risk. Um, so I'll sort of get into a bit of what that is for those that don't know in a minute. But basically, looking at what is there and what is um, essentially changing as well in terms of that landscape of risk. Um, are we looking to, to talk a bit about what's best practice in terms of organisational manager, managerial level um, intervention for building mentally healthy workplaces? And um, finally touching a bit on just in terms, just that evidence base around personal wellbeing and, and, and obviously this applies to uh, Managers as much as anybody else. This idea of, and and in, in some sense, it's more so because of the role that um, managers have in, uh, and managers and leaders have in 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 leading others. So, I think um, it's always important to recognise uh, the the importance of, uh, I guess, personal well-being um, when it comes to to the work we do. Um, so, I guess in in kicking off, well, why why in workplace mental health? Why is this an area in which I've sort of devoted a lot of time. It's not a particularly uh, sexy area when it comes to workplace, when it comes to mental health. I think, you know, it doesn't get a lot of attention in a lot of ways um, in the broader community. But we do spend about, you know, a third of our, most adults spend about a third of their adult lives working. Um, so it takes up a considerable amount of time. And not only that, we know that, um, you know, each, each year about one in five, uh, adults will experience a um, mental health, a diagnosable mental health condition um, either and that and these figures are, are common mental health disorders. So this is anxiety disorders and depression and, and substance use. Um, and that that's actually one in um, that's almost one in five when we consider when we consider lifetime prevalence. So it, it's, these are Sorry, these are sorry. That's almost uh, one in two. Sorry, when we talk about lifetime prevalence, so that's about forty-five percent. So there's, 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 I guess, overwhelming figures when we consider the, the the prevalence rates of these conditions. But they also have significant. I mean, there's also significant um, evidence to suggest that there's and the, these rates are on the increase, and and that evidence comes from a range of um, sources of data, but I'm just presenting one here in terms of this, this just graph shows the proportion of total disability support recipients. Um, and you'll see that gray line, the only one that's really increasing there over the last 20 years or so is um, the disability support payments for the receipt for, for psychological and psychiatric injury. Um, and the, the, this figure some, somewhat mirrors the um, safe work data around claims. Um, there's, a, there's a range of other sources of data which present this same story. And in, in some in some respects, there's the the potential that we are just getting better at getting better at recognizing it, um, getting better at talking about it. But I think um, we do need to consider the fact that there may indeed be um, good reasons for an actual true change in, in the prevalence rate. So it's something, certainly something to be aware of and it's something that um, I think moving forward is, is probably one of the biggest uh, issues facing a lot of, of organisations um, because we know this has dramatic financial implications. Um, the Productivity Commission released this um, these figures uh, about two years ago now, but the um, it, the estimate for mental health costs for Australia is about um, 39 billion when it comes to lost economic participation and productivity, and the bulk of that is is costs associated with um, presenteeism, so showing up to work and but not being able to work at at full um, productivity, uh, and and also absenteeism costs. Um, 
so we know that that one in five is at least one in five Australian employees have taken time off in the last 12 months um, for mental health reasons and um, these data is actually this data is a little bit old so I I, I, I would estimate it's, it's the best data we have but I would estimate that's actually higher um, currently um, but it's definitely higher where employees consider their workplace to be mentally unhealthy which probably comes as no surprise the other aspect I suppose when it comes to uh, economic impact for organizations is is obviously turnover so we know that at least one in two I'm oh, sorry two in five uh, individuals have left the job due to a mentally unhealthy um, environment. So I suppose that's the other aspect to consider in terms of cost. Um, and this is from a survey that was done a couple of a few years ago and it, 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 it just um, indicates that, that not only is it having, I guess, all this, these financial impacts, but workers themselves consider it to be a pretty significant issue and one that um, is often believed to be felt to be not being addressed and I think the the other aspect to consider when it comes to this figure is these rates are actually much higher in larger businesses um, about twice as high and I suppose that's somewhat unsurprising in a lot of ways just in the in the way that larger organizations um, I mean I think larger organizations have a lot of advantages in terms of and be resourcing around mental health and well-being programs sometimes but there is certainly uh obviously with size comes a lot more complexity when it comes to um taking care of individual employees and workers um so i think that so i think that's something to consider but when when we talk about this idea of well, well why is it so important i, I guess what 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 is it that makes up um mentally healthy workplaces and and I guess to that to that end, what is it about work that contributes to mental health risk? Um, the inverse of that, we know that, um, and 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 all too often I think I talk a lot about um, you know, the 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 links between aspects of work and, and mental health. But the 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 um, it's important to recognize that obviously work contributes a lot to our mental health as well the I, you know no one's when it comes to mental health uh, mental ill health prevalence um mental disorder prevalence it's highest amongst those that, that are unemployed um so it, i think that sort of is is the important um qualifier here that work does a lot of good for our mental health in in terms of um giving us a sense of purpose satisfaction achievement along with all the financial and social um, benefits of work but there are aspects when it comes to work that can um, that can contribute to to risk when it comes to mental health and um, this is a pretty crude breakdown of, of categorizing some of those um, risk factors um, so firstly this idea of job factors is a pivotal one and, and one that's often I think overlooked but when we talk about job factors we're talking about things in within the job itself and the work itself that is put that puts individual at risk so that could be um the you know a remote or isolated work um where individuals are away from their their social networks and that sort of thing um any any aspects of work job insecurity um aspects pertaining to role conflict or, or a lack of role clarity um where there's an effort and reward imbalance when it comes to the job that, that the individuals are doing role overload so this idea of, of uh, i'll come to this a bit later as well but this idea of often of high very high job demand or high workload um and the other component when we consider demand it goes hand in hand with that is often uh job control so i'll talk about this again a bit later but it's um Job control is, is, is specifically around this idea of how much control an individual has over how they do their job or when they do it, um, aspects of autonomy um, when it comes to the work they do. We know that's that's very linked to um, well-being for, for individuals. Um, there's also, I guess, operational or team factors and and and, and that's sort of the, the category of, of labeled that one, but it's 
it's often the more the social relationships when it comes to work or the physical environment in which those jobs are conducted. So hazardous physical environments contribute to um, psychosocial risk, but obviously also all these all aspects pertaining to bullying, harassment, support from supervisors and colleagues, res um, resources or lack, or lack of resources, um, and any aspects of conflict and, and um, interpersonal difficulties within uh, the workplace. Finally, this idea of it's almost an overarching factor of organisational factors, and and these are present whether it be a very small, um, you know, business or a, or a you know multinational one. And it comes down to aspects of organisational culture. Um, sometimes this can be this is termed a psycho psychosocial safety climate, psychological safety safety climate. Um, it's kind of a fancy way of basically talking about some of those more um, broad cultural aspects around mental health and well-being and the value in which um, organisations place on, on employees um, within them. Um, and it, and it's a, part, a core part of that is obviously the aspects of stigma, um, uh, other, other components of that are, I guess, at an organisational level risk factors is poor organisational change consultation and poor procedural justice. And that's just talking about at, the way in which um, perceptions of fairness and, and transparency within an organisation. So none, none of these um, factors, I think, would surprise anybody. Um, but I think it's important to reflect on the impacts that they can have when it comes to um, mental health and wellbeing. Um, but when we consider all of those factors, I think one of the critical things to also take away and, and especially I think in the context of this talk is what do we know about what is changing or what are the um, factors that are probably of critical importance moving forward. Um, I think job security is a major one. Um, we're limited sometimes in what we can do in terms of intervention and, and preventing job insecurity uh, um, but that a major drug that's a particularly um, well, particularly among, among certain populations. So usually those at highest risk. So young young people, job insecurity is on the rise, um, driven by COVID. Um, and the another critical aspect is remote work. We're seeing so much more of that now. When I talk about remote work here, I suppose I'm largely talking about digitalization um, and what's happened post, uh, post COVID when it comes to a lot of largely white collar work, I, th I think in terms of being able to do work remotely, which, which comes with a lot of positives in terms of flexibility and um, sometimes work home balance and, and reductions in commute times and that sort of thing. But there are a number of negatives when it comes to uh, remote work and it can sometimes be you know largely these might be around um, isolation um, and and a lack of social connectivity um, also uh, I guess just uh, this comes I guess to this point of um, role clarity and 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 supervisor support there's this idea of not being present in in an office environment with a with a visible um, manager can lead to some difficulties in terms of being able to um, manage the work and uh, that's coming through and, and can has implications at a sort of wellbeing level. We are seeing, uh, I think what's interesting in terms of changes in terms of job control, as I mentioned, this, um, this idea that uh, there's the, the amount of freedom in which individuals have about how, but also when they do their work, we're seeing an increase in terms of the the when. So we're seeing a lot more um, seeing trends uh, toward more job control when it comes to when workers are able to do their work. Um, how we're sort of seeing declines in how in in the freedom associated with how. So essentially, that's we're seeing a lot less autonomy um, in terms of um, individual perceptions around the work they do and and their ownership of it. Um, and that's co that coincides, I think, with this other with this other idea of, of jobs complexity increasing. So over the last twenty years, we've 
been looking at some of this data and, and we're, we're seeing it overall in, in Australia, we're seeing, in, I guess, increases in job complex, um, perceived job complexity. So why that's important, I'll, I'll sort of get to in a sec, but it goes to this idea of these competing concepts of, of control and, and job demand and, and where, they, where, they, where they work together in, in a positive way and where they work together in, in sort of more that negative aspect. In terms of the other aspects that are changing of, over the last sort of 20 odd years, um, we are seeing, in terms of overall claim data, there's there's some indication of of small increases when it comes to mental health claims. But what's important is the size of the claim. So we're seeing a lot more, um, a, a, well, large, more expensive claims, and and individuals being off work for much longer. So this is increased by about the length of time they've been off. The individuals are off work is increased by about eighty six percent over the last. Uh, 20 years, um, and the cost has increased by about 30%. Um, and the main cited reasons for that um, are aspects of work pressure, um, which I think kind of goes to this idea of, of job demand and, and complexity, and probably one that's not easy to, um, not always easy to um, intervene on at times. But these concepts of workplace bullying and harassment and, and workplace violence are, are, are significant contributors. And um, these, are, these are two aspects that certainly we should be able to address ultimately in work in the workplace. Um, and in, in line with that, I guess the main thing I want to talk about today is what can be done and what the evidence um, out there is for, for intervention. Um, what's important what's important when we consider intervention um and what isn't and i suppose one thing that i want to um highlight is the the way in which it, it is sometimes treated tokenistically i think and and this is not necessarily anyone's fault i think it's a diff it can be a difficult issue to address adequately and even where you you know where i work in this space uh, every day, there's you know there's not a lot of easy there's no easy solutions here, and and not only are we trying to manage mental health within our workplaces, there's a number of you know individuals bring a number of personal um, uh, in, in biopsychosocial factors to to the workplace, but also we exist in a in a um, in a broader world as well so the, the organizations and businesses are have to exist in those work in that broader world but so to and that that has um implications for what can be done and resourcing around mental health in the workplace but also individuals um you know what we've seen in the last few years in terms of um you know whether it be bushfires or um you know obviously the pandemic um, changes in um, issues with uh, in terms of availability of resourcing um, both for individuals and for organizations in, in terms of those disruption of um, uh, disruption in terms of commodity markets um, the war obviously the war we're seeing in in the Ukraine and and, and the the, probably the biggest thing now, and, and well, floods we're seeing as well, but the biggest thing now probably being just the financial and economic uncertainty that is present. But I put this slide up basically because I think there's, um, it's important to attack this problem uh, in a number of ways, and it's, it's not easily solved, and that is the critical thing. So I think this, this is, uh, what I'm about to put up is slightly complex framework for intervention, but I'll walk through it. So this idea of an individual may be at any point, uh, may kind of be at work at any point on this mental health spectrum from a healthy worker to to being you know off on, on potentially long-term sickness absence for mental health reason. And they will move through those different, um, they may move through those different, um, that different spectrum at, at different times. 
as organisations, uh, it's important to consider when we talk and, and manage it. So it's important to consider both protective interventions uh, and ways in which to protect the well-being and um, and mental health of our workers, but also ways in which we can respond once those you know if and if and when individuals become unwell. And then finally, and this is probably a newer aspect when we consider workplace mental health and, and well-being and, and work in general is this idea of promoting good well-being beyond this idea of of a I guess a, a weakness based model so looking at the strengths and, and looking again at this idea of what are the positive things that work can do for our well-being what are the ways in which we can structure um, workplaces and and jobs to I guess push more of this idea of what of, of promoting the positive um, what are the what are the how can we drive home the, the positive aspects of the work um, rather than simply um, looking at it as a, as a deficits based model so it's just this is more a strengths based approach but um, the idea of these interventions is that they also work across different levels of an organization so this this idea of this interventions at a systems level interventions that are operational based um, and then those that that individual that are offered to individuals um, and traditionally a lot of the focus is on that category so it's quite easy to um, find a program that you can roll out that um, builds employee resilience and um, there's a place for those uh, interventions but I think often um, traditionally there's been a failure at times to acknowledge the um those higher level um factors and, and what we can be doing to try to assist and um and promote good mental health and, and respond in those higher levels um so some of the types of intervention that i'm talking about here is is interventions to um uh, maximize um positive job design and, and and minimize the harm associated with the carrying out the jobs themselves um, organizational resilience through policy procedure and practice and, and ultimately good management and that that idea of at a sort of systems and operational level really um, personal prevention programs and and personalized early intervention programs and, and these are what I was referring to previously so the distinction there being one being that type of universal program that you offer to everyone um, to build resilience and the other one be the other kind of intervention being those those that are offered to individuals that are maybe symptomatic or, or becoming unwell. Um, programs to facilitate early help seeking um, and finally programs to support recovery and return to work if individuals are at that um, pointy end I suppose of, of that mental health spectrum that I mentioned earlier. And um, so this idea that these fit into different levels of I guess different classifications of intervention not necessarily important except that there are different places in which I think it's critical to acknowledge that there are different strategies work differently depending on where an individual is on that spectrum so rolling out certain programs is not necessarily effective certain programs will not have the same effect at a universal primary prevention level um, that they might at a tertiary level. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's important to recognise, I guess, that the workplaces sit um, within a much larger framework and, and there's aspects of that are internal to individuals mostly, lifestyle factors, their own social networks and, and their biological and social determinants that they bring to jobs, but also this external, um, these external frameworks that we reside within. Um, and speaking to that, on a, when we talk about workplace mental health, it's important to recognise there is there is um, a lot of things that organisations and, and managers 
can do and, and ideally should do. There are also a lot of things that are mandated. There, are, there is a new code of practice um, for managing psych, psychosocial hazards in the workplace, or well, newish last year that was released. Um, so there's a lot of progress, I guess, as well. There's a lot of awareness um, emerging, I think, in this space, um, and that goes at a policy and, and legislative level as well. But the focus um, I really wanted to push today was this idea of these different levels and, and the kinds of things that we know have evidence and maybe the kind of things that, that don't have as strong evidence supporting their rollout. And, um, and I think that's just as important to recognise in terms of where to put where to get bang for buck when it comes to allocation of resources um, for workplace mental health. So, design, so this idea of first up designing work to minimise harm. So there's, there's some evidence around this. There's a generally a, these kind, this kind of research is hard to do. So there's not a huge amount of really good studies out there indicating great ways in which organisations can improve their employee employees' mental health by changes to job design. It's not to say that it's not critically important. It's just hard to sort of, it's hard to um, do conduct that research. Having said all that, some of the big, and some of the, I guess the important aspects to consider here are this idea of increasing um, work participation in jobs and, and in their job design. So the idea of improving, as I mentioned, improving aspects of worker control and reducing demand where possible, um, and uh, it, it, policies around flexible working conditions is helpful when it comes to control. Obviously, that's another aspect that we have here. And any of the interventions is aimed at, specific, at reducing specific risks, and these will be different for every organisation. But I think it goes to this idea of the importance of knowing and uh, assessing what the risks within your organisation and, and team are. Um, and just to talk again a bit about this idea of job strain. So this is the idea of high job demand, low job control. So this is that we know that this this category, that, that idea there of high job strain is the comes with the greatest risk when it comes to workplace mental health issues. So anything that can be done here in terms of reducing demand, so capping hours is a big one, which I'll get to in a sec. Um, for some organisations, um, appropriate scheduling of tasks, manager awareness of appropriate staffing uh, and mandated breaks. These are some of the interventions we see rolled out, but also anything to increase worker control. So these ideas of, of interventions to increase autonomy and shared decision making, clarity around roles and, and consultation and communication um, with workers is, is um, also seem to be positive in terms of improving worker control and thus um, mental health outcomes. And I'll just talk very briefly about uh, some work we did looking at working hours in, in doctors. And I won't dwell on this because it, it's not going to be relevant. The idea of this isn't necessarily relevant to everyone. But I think it show, it highlights how important simple changes in job design can be. So this just highlights that as the working hours of junior doctors increased, um, where it reached over 55 hours, there was twice the risk of suicidal ideation and mental health um, and common mental health disorders as there was at 40 to 45 hours. So you can see quite linearly this tr transition of where it, the, the greater, as hours are increasing, that risk is really going up. So I think that just highlights how simple, how a simple intervention for a group like that in terms of capping hours could have considerable impact. Um, this idea of organisational resilience through good management, we'll talk a bit more about this in a second or toward the end, but um, in terms of interventions that we know are effective, Good manager and leadership mental health training has been shown to have really good outcomes, certainly in terms of building knowledge, skills and, and attitudes around mental health, uh, as well as behaviours. Um, aspects of team and, and well, team works group support interventions, there's also evidence for that. Um, 
These are, and then there's less evidence, unfortunately, to support anti-stigma programs in the workplace, anti-bullying programs, um, and change management interventions. Again, not to say that these programs aren't effective or aren't important, but we don't have really good evidence to show great effects there. Um, but we do know that all those three things are critical risk factors that, that need to be addressed. Um, when it comes to manager training and this idea of improving um, employee mental health through, through manager mental health training. Um, firstly, this idea of, uh, we, firstly, first and foremost, we know how important line managers are to individuals' wellbeing and, and mental health um, across the board. This is, a, this is something we, we come up with, we come to time and time again, is the critical importance of managers. This, this graph just highlights that um, employee perception of both manager behavior and team culture where, where we see where we've done some work looking at unsupportive manager behavior and team culture versus supportive and you can see again it, it it's essentially associated that access there is um is symptoms so that's mental that's com that's psychological distress um symptoms of common mental disorder so it's we see that where the manager behavior is unsupportive, it's um, the scores are almost double uh, that of, of, of those teams that had considered their managers to be supportive um, when it comes to their mental health and wellbeing. Um, and, and so, and if that's the case, what can be done to ultimately improve manager behavior, manager, um, uh, the role of managers in this space? So there's a number of programs out there, but we developed and evaluated a digital program. We've also um, evaluated a face-to-face -face program with similar, which I'll come to in a sec as well. But um, the digital program was slightly different in, in that it focused both on reactive strategies, which, which the face-to-face -face program does as well. And when I say reactive, I, I guess I, I'm talking about those where where where, we're cons where managers are concerned about employees and and how to act and and assist um, in that space, but also this idea of what managers can do to minimise mental health risks in the workplace and these preventative strategies as well, um, which can be much harder to see change on at times, but um, nonetheless I think is critical to uh, preventing um, later. Uh, preventing getting to that reactive straight stage ultimately. So this the training covers aspects of how to be a respectful and responsible manager, managing and communicating uh, existing um, and future work, uh, managing particular individuals as well as difficult situations. Um, and we saw this this training was associated with increases in uh, manager confidence um, uh, in terms of managing employee mental health um, and, and mental ill health. We saw increases in um, uh, the responsive behaviours, the self-reported responsive behaviours of, of managers and um, also self-reported um, increases in self-reported preventative behaviours uh, for mental health, mental, employee mental health um, increase. So that just highlights that I think again the and, and those are sustained uh, uh, as well over time. So I think it just important, it highlights the importance of appropriately training managers in this area, um, which is something we don't always, you know, I think a lot of managers don't naturally get that sort of training. Um, so I think that's an important thing to consider. Um, the third aspect is personal resilience. Um, again, you probably have come across a lot of these types of programs. A lot of them are work mental health promotion. I think what's critical is 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 they go beyond just promoting good mental health and give uh, give individual skills. Um, and often that comes in the form of cognitive behavioral therapy type skills um, or sometimes mindfulness programs is the other big one that we see a lot of. Uh, sometimes these are digital and sometimes they're face to face offerings. Um, physical activity programs are also a common thing we see sometimes it might be um, yoga programs in the workplaces or other physical uh, activity interventions that 
uh, do are associated with improving individual wellbeing. Um, there's less evidence for some of the other programs, but there are a number of other pieces of work that do exist in terms of nature-based programs and art therapy and sort of that sort of thing. Um, this is an example of, of something that we've evaluated, which and we developed and evaluated at the Black Dog Institute, um, which is a mindfulness and, and it's got a, a largely behavioral activation uh, app called the Ed, Headgear app. And it's a 30 day intervention uh, consisting largely of adaptive coping skills, um, behavioral activation and, um, and mindfulness. And, and the idea being that it could be rolled out universally um, to individuals, regardless of, of symptom presentation. And um, we found that that was associated with reductions in depression symptoms uh, and improvements in work performance and reduction, uh, improvements in resilience and well-being. We also found that it's associated with a halved rate of new incidence depression. So this idea that um, in this in this um, group, we've, we're looking at those who were not uh, reaching a threshold of clinical depression at, at baseline. And um, those that received the headgear app compared to a, a comparative app, we saw the new cases of depression halved with over um, a 12 month period within that group. Um, importantly also, I think, I think this has this has flow-on effects when it comes to functional improvement. And as I mentioned, obviously one of the big problems when it comes to mental health and, and work is the impacts it has not only at an individual level, but the flow-on effects for organizations. And um, we also assessed uh, work productivity within that study. And we found that the app was associated with um, increases in work productivity equivalent to about an extra day of effective work per month. Um, and that's self-reported productivity, but nevertheless, we, that was consistent um, again and, and consistent over the 12 month follow up that we eventually did on that app. Um, so again, highlights the importance of, of, of those personal resilience programs. And as I mentioned, they're, they're sort of one, one tool, I think, that, that is useful um, and but not, I suppose, the, the, the whole piece of the puzzle. Um, the, the next category is, is um, this idea of promoting and facilitating early help seeking. And there's a lot of stuff out there that's, that exists, I think, here um, with mixed levels of success, I think, when it comes to changing, um, to, to improving mental ill health, certainly the aspects of psychological therapy and um, where those are rolled out within organisations have really good um, evidence to support them. Uh, aspects of screening and, and mental health first aid and peer support schemes are, are mixed. There's a bit less evidence there. Um, a lot of work, work, a lot of big organizations obviously have EAP services, which again are a really valuable tool when it comes to getting individuals help and getting it early. I think the critical thing here is this idea if we know that the earlier individuals can get help they need, the better the functional improvement, the faster that improvement and the less likely we are to see long-term um, issues when it comes to mental ill health. Now, and finally, this idea of supporting those um, who, supporting recovery within those who are experiencing a, ment a mental health issue. Um, and when it comes to the evidence around that, this idea of supportive, a, a critical thing here, I think for, for, you know, certainly for this, um, for you guys is, is this idea of supportive return to work interventions and being a supportive manager at, at that level. There are other programs that have good evidence, but they're largely a, a bit more complex in terms of individual placement and support programs, work focused psychological therapy, and they're not, then they sit largely outside the realm of a traditional manager. But this idea of being able to be supportive and facilitate return to work is an important one. Um, and sometimes and a, a, big, a big component of that really is making appropriate adjustments um, for individuals returning or, 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 or even prior to needing to go on long-term or go on sickness absence for mental health reasons. 
but mostly around that facilitating those adjustments to the work or to the working time in order to um, in, in order to manage um, individuals uh, and and manage well-being and mental health where um, where individuals are sort of at that pointy end, I suppose. Um, and this is just an example of of, of this the sort of face-to-face -face training as well that is focused around that that end of the spectrum. And I think the main thing I wanted to raise here was just this idea that of of the model itself. It's it's, it's referred to the respect model, but this idea where individuals do go on, um, or or well, are becoming unwell, or even have taken time off because they are unwell. This idea of regular contact being essential. Um, the earlier that contact can occur, the better. Um, and it should be supportive and, and empathetic communication, providing practical help, um, but not but not you know not psychotherapy. I don't, we don't ex no one expects managers to be clinicians here, but this idea that um, an individual that there's a, there is a lot that managers can do um, to facilitate that that um, facilitate that help seeking where necessary and, and guide um, employees into appropriate care. Um, and that goes to this idea of encouraging help seeking there. Um, and the final two points just being considering the, the return to work options for the employee. And, and as I mentioned there, that may involve making appropriate and necessary changes to the, to the jobs themselves or the work that the employees do. And, um, and again, that idea of open communication and having open door policy is, is that final step within that program. Um, but that training itself was only four hours and we and we found that, I mean, the main change we saw was increased confidence um, from the managers when it came to managing mental ill health. And we did this training with, um, I mean, with uh, we, we do it with a range of workforces, but we, we evaluated it here amongst um, uh, duty commanders in New South Wales Fire and Rescue. So, obviously a high risk workforce when it comes to mental ill health due to the rates of trauma exposure. Um, but we not only did find that these improvements, we also, it was also associated with a significant return on the investment um, in the program of, of $10 for every dollar spent. So I suppose, again, that just highlights the, the importance and the, um, I guess the, the economic value when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, so looking at um, practical advice for organisations, um, the I've covered a lot of this stuff, but I thought I'd throw it, throw this slide in. I think the idea of, of implementing and promoting strategy, as mental health strategy is so critical, and a lot of you guys probably have these already, but this idea of continual auditing in terms of working out where the risks lie Offering evidence-based programs, I think that's the critical thing here. Um, there's a lot of things out there with no evidence, um, and that senior managers should should also participate in these programs where possible. Um, it's important to promote flexible working uh, arrangements where we can to and, and any other interventions to improve employee job control um, and um, provide opportunities for work-life balance. And there is also this idea of this effort reward um, system. So this idea of recognition systems are also beneficial to create and, and any other aspects that creates culture of care and around of employee value across the organization. Um, and um, and there's a couple other things listed there. I'll move on now to the manage, I'm conscious of time. So I'll just move on now to this idea of managers themselves and and Again, some of these overlap because obviously um, a lot of it depends on the, the business as well, where the manager lies versus the organisation itself. But um, it's important for managers to undertake mental health and wellbeing training where offered. Um, consider customising jobs um, to increase job control and satisfaction, but also, as I mentioned, um, potentially customising jobs where an individual is unwell. And I know this is an easier thing said than done in many at many times, but we do know has has benefit to the to the organisation and and the business overall. Um, it's important to maintain regular catch ups and and particularly one on one meetings where you're concerned about stuff, um, 
and also look out for signs of struggle um, and try to provide support both in and beyond workplace where, where possible. But pro the main thing here, I think, is promoting this culture of employee value across the team and, and your team and, and fundamentally also to be aware of your own mental health because I think that's um, critical as well, this recognition that managers are our employees themselves and our people themselves. And to that end, I think often some of you may be familiar with this figure, but this just presents, it's, it's, a, um, it's a graph of pressure and performance and it's a quite an old um, concept. But often, I think, especially today, we are functioning really in this, in this strain point. So this is what, what sometimes termed the zone of delusion where we think we're performing, um, we think by working harder, we're performing better, but um, actually our performance is declining um, and we're heading towards this idea of burnout. And burnout is a concept that we hear a lot about these days. Um, I think it's a little bit, it, it's often referred to it, it, in a number of ways. There is a, there is a sort of syn psychological syndrome that comes with a number of symptom clusters, but it's not a diagnosable disorder. And, um, but I think nonetheless, we have a, a lot of individuals can feel burnt out, even if they aren't necessarily meeting all these, um, all these symptom, each of these symptom clusters. So this idea of being elements of it, having elements of exhaustion, negativity and cynicism and reduced productivity. And this just highlights some of the, the ways in which that may present in terms of both physical and um, emotional, uh, emotional health and just this overall feeling of being drained. So where uh, I think one thing that comes up here is, you know, where, where are we most at risk of burnout? What, what's the thing, what are the thing, major things to look out for? And the big aspects from the research here is that it, it's most pronounced where demand really outweighs resources. So that's, the, I guess, the fundamental critical thing here. Um, having demanding jobs is is not in itself a bad thing. A lot of people thrive on that, but where it outweighs the resources that individuals have to manage that work is a problem. A big issue really as well we know when it comes to burnout is expectation. So unrelenting in expectations. And we see a lot of that when it in terms of the individuals most at risk sometimes of, of burnout. There is some evidence to suggest that those that are highly perfectionistic and those with high levels of empathy are most at risk. So again, this idea of the, both those groups having particularly high expectations of themselves when it comes to the work they do. And um, also, I guess in line with that idea of expectation management is um, an inability to, to sort of set good limits. And, um, and I think that's a difficult thing at times to do. So, I just wanted to sort of finish with a few aspects in terms of staying well and some of the critical things to consider um, in terms of maintaining good well-being. Um, and I, I sort of pull these into three big areas. The first one being, um, and not I think the critical thing to acknowledge is not all of these things work for everyone. Some people really thrive on mindfulness and meditation, but other people prefer to, you know, spend have some time to play golf or to do whatever, and I think that's a that's this that's a critical aspect here. Of, but the but the fundamentally, both those any of those activities bring individuals into the present and into a state of flow. And and often the issue when it comes to burnout and poor well-being is we're pulled too far into the future in terms of um, stress and and also carry a lot with us from the past. So these ideas that focus on the present. Um, another big in terms of um, improving mental health. Another big aspect here is, is social connection, so connecting with others and also being able to connect with the natural world. Um, a second category of care is all the stuff we know we should do and we should do more of in terms of getting appropriate sleep, diet and exercise and limiting drugs and alcohol, but also limiting engagement into behave, with the behaviours and, and, and aspects that we know feed anxiety or distress. Um, finally, this idea of action, so actively working for balance within our lives. Um, and a big thing there is including um, value-driven action into our everyday. So what are the things we can do 
that add pleasure and achievement to the to you know we're all very overwhelmed i think with with work at times but it's important that windows are carved out for these things in order to avoid burnout and avoid those um, really negative uh, well-being implications there's other also good evidence for altruism and and gratitude practice um, and i think the main thing there is to acknowledge to get help when you need when you need where it's needed um, these are just a few quick uh, ones i threw in for work itself i think it's important to separate yourself from your expectations that's a kind of critical one when it comes to burnout being protective of your own time is also fundamentally important so work we know can sort of expand to fill at any time so having that those limits clearly set are important um, replacing tech time with with time in nature as sort of came to earlier and, and a big important one there is taking holiday leave final one i've got down there is, is creating good boundaries um, and there is an interesting TED talk out there on, on a, the third space, if anyone's interested, but this idea of being able to really appropriately disconnect um, our work from, from our home lives. And I think that's an important one, especially now we have so much working from home going on. Um, so that's about it from me. Um, I think I apologize for going a bit longer. I think we have a few minutes left, um, but uh, thank you all for, for listening. Hey Mark, thank, thank you so much for uh, a really wonderful presentation, practical information that's really bang on and really on point. Um, there's a couple of quick questions. We've only got a few minutes, but um, one of the ones is around generational differences. So where um, do you find that we are seeing a big shift and difference between generations of workers um, and that older workers perhaps used to put up with certain stuff and, and younger workers aren't? Is that, is that playing into the data? It's a really, it's a really good question, and um, we are. I'm currently working on a trying to unpack some data around that because I think the you see you see trends with with younger workers especially, and it always begs the question: Is it, you know, ultimately are younger are younger people just worse at managing the same stuff, you know, and and it often it often get questioned about, you know, is it just a sort of like snowflake kind of idea? What the data I'm looking at is trying to disentangle is is those effects, those age effects from cohort effects. So if you're born at a certain, you know, if you're, um, you know, so we have, so we have, is it, is it due to just being a young person, just being a 20 year old person? Is it being a young young person today um, in this climate, um, or is it, um, or is it also the individual things faced? because you are a young person today. And essentially what we've seen is even at, even where there is a fundamental difference um, in the way in which um, some of these risk factors have affected people. In, in short, there is, there is some evidence to, to highlight, and, and the work I'm doing is, is looking into this, to highlight that there are actual real changes that, are, that kind of go beyond, I think, simply, simply that um, age effect. And we are seeing basically, um, yeah, young, younger people today probably being um, a number of uh, individual risk factors being more pronounced within that group. But yes, it's a, it's a, it's a complex one to disentangle, I think. And I thought it would be a little bit complicated, so I appreciate. Um, I think we're um, pretty well out of time, so I think I, uh, you know, you'd all join with me in uh, congratulating Mark for putting up some wonderful data. Um, my observation is there's a lot of work to do um, since mental health issues have crossed over from uh, physical injuries at work the gap just seems to be um, getting bigger. And certainly if, if we could put the same attention in the workplace as we've done on the physical injuries, um, we might be getting somewhere in, in chipping away at that gap. But um, if you're uh, leaving us here today, I wanna to thank you for joining us for Development Day. If you're joining us for the next session, we look forward to welcome you back. Please, if you're, if you're leaving, please check out our website, managersandleaders.com. Lots of great things happening um, up to the end of the year and then in the new year. Uh, again, I want to thank you, Mark, for what is a, a wonderful presentation and um, the great work that Black Dog Institute are doing 
uh, and hopefully we can um, really get on top of what is a very big problem in the workplace. But thank you again. And Thanks thank you, sir. everybody.